Mm-hmm. You there, Tim? Yeah, hi. Hi there, mate. How are you? Hi, Thomas. Hi there. How's it going, Sergey? Um, I'm fine. Well, it shouldn't be a problem. Fairly uh, specialized, I'd imagine. So, uh, you're going to move to the valley? Yes, yes. Uh, well, congratulations. <laughs> I used to live in Sonoma <laughs> County for uh, three years. It's uh, quite an experience mm. ahead of you. I can pretty much guarantee you. So, yes, nice. it's interesting. <laughs> mm. How's it going with uh, you, Tim? Yeah, great. Well, uh, very, very nice. Uh, it's pretty cold around here, but uh, nice. Anyways, uh, hopefully I will go there soon uh, and uh, I will be ready with agents to prepare everything yeah. before I go there to select a better place. Looking forward uh, to getting you yeah. down here again. Yeah, cool. Okay, and uh, let's get uh, started. Uh, we then uh, are feel free to uh, talk about what, what you want to and I will uh, moderate it uh, at first time. Uh, here it will be interview questions, and after that, uh, this is uh, Sergey. Uh, we'll discuss some news. You can uh, stay here for it or uh, can uh, leave as you wish. Yeah. Just okay. uh, w- w- when you're um, when you're asking questions, maybe say Thomas or Sergey, such that you know we don't uh, talk in each both answer. Okay. At the sure. Same time. Sure. Yeah. Okay, Thomas, uh, let's get started uh, with the uh, introduction. Uh, can you please tell about yourself you, uh, for our listeners? Uh, what's your name, professional area, and what are you know, your questions about? Yeah, so my name is uh, Thomas Hansen. I work in the fintech, uh, fintech industry. And uh, I've been coding since I was uh, eight years old. Actually, my first computer was an Oric one having 48 k's of uh, RAM. So. So uh, this implies I have uh, 38 years, arguably, of uh, coding experience, you might argue. Although, obviously, not uh, that many years as a professional coder. Uh, I live and work in uh, Cyprus in the fintech, uh, fintech industry uh, as a Forex uh, software developer. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I guess uh, that's it. Yeah. And uh, what are you most passionate about areas for now? Yeah, I'm extremely um, interested in uh, the ideas of uh, automation. You see, uh, I perceive uh, the software development industry today basically as being in its uh, Stone Age infantile period. And I believe uh, 20 years from now we're going to be laughing of uh, the amount of manual labor we actually had to do in these days we are currently living within. So I agree with Alan Kay in those regards that the so-called computer revolution hasn't even uh, started yet. We're living arguably in the age of Stone Age uh, with uh, the equivalent analogy being that of the steam engine uh, in relationship to the uh, car manufacturing industry back in the late uh, 19th century. So I'm extremely passionate about automation and I don't believe that we will be creating software the way we do today, 20 years down the road. I believe that computers will do the bulk of the job according to instructions we provide to it in an extremely high level language, probably something equivalent to the English spoken language for that matter. And that will be the way we create the software 20 years down the road. Yeah, that's uh, pretty great. But uh, what are uh, you think is uh, are pretty uh, hottest areas around here uh, on automation process? What will be the uh, biggest, hottest area in the next decades? Well, uh, the world always needs uh, administration tools, right? Uh, such as, for instance, uh, CRM systems, accounting systems, uh, uh, booking appointment systems, etc., etc. And these are the love hanging fruits, uh, the way I see it. And uh, all of these systems are basically 
permutations over the same system. And with the same system, I mean that we have a database, we want to store stuff in the database and extract stuff from it, and we want to have a user experience a front end allowing us to do that uh, securely and in a rational way that you know meets our business requirements so to speak the problem is that there are literally just as many different permutations of that arguably exact same system as there are different types of businesses a dental might need a a dentist might need a completely different ordering uh, system than, for instance, uh, a restaurant. Still, they have these exact same more or less needs. And I believe that such systems will be the first one that we are capable of successfully completely automating the creation of. So, because they're so similar in nature, they all really have the same problems arguably but they all require specializations of some sort you know allowing the dentist to have different parameters he's storing in his database than the local restaurant however they're all yep. based upon the same axiom of software development which is administrative tools so does that make sense yeah sure i think uh, it will be interesting for, for you to know what uh, recently, uh, in Russian, uh, some of uh, such type of systems are becoming popular uh, for some special industries. And uh, what's uh, important to know here uh, is uh, uh, currently Russia have laws uh, which are making uh, taxation more transparent. Uh, mm. Now everything uh, is automatically sent. Uh, our transactions are sent uh, to uh, actually low. Uh, I mean, uh, for uh, checking out what uh, was the transactions, so what should be actual taxation. Well, there is a lot of uh, interesting software development going on in uh, Russia. I mean, you know, you have Nginx, and you know, you have a lot of really, really interesting projects, and. At least here locally on the island, uh, my first job interview here actually, I told, uh, actually George, my second job interview, sorry, I told George, uh, our manager, that uh, I knew C++ and his uh, immediate reaction were, wow, you know C++? I thought only Russians knew that. Very <laughs> <laughs> interesting. It's actually a uh, uh, language. <laughs> Uh, and, and that was kind of like a, a compliment to, to Russian developers. So Russian developers, at least here in Cyprus, have a very, very high star. They're perceived as being very, very uh, skilled at their profession. So uh, I'm not surprised by you telling me that there's a lot of interesting things going on in Russia. Uh, maybe it's uh, just a remnant of uh old uh, system of uh, education from USSR because we have uh, very strong math school and physics etc and all that related to uh, also IT sector. That is actually a very interesting um, thought actually because um, I mean one of my hobbies is chess and I follow chess uh, quite closely and I read up about the latest chess news, I've studied chess history and so on. And of course, you know, if you pick like, you know, the last hundred years of, you know, top 100 uh, chess players, probably 92 of them would be Russians. <laughs> or yeah. from the USSR, you know, like, you know, Tal from uh, Liga, and still it's within the, the old Soviet Union. So, and I know for a fact that uh, you guys back in the Soviet days used to actually have mandatory chess teachings even during um, uh, kindergarten. So, I'm, I'm not surprised uh, of you drawing that analogy. So, not uh, short of uh, mandatory, but it was pretty popular back then mm -hmm. and still popular in some way. Yep. Yeah, and it's part of uh, competition with US, maybe. Back in those days, from well, back in those days, I think the argument was that you know uh, USSR wanted to prove how communism was uh, superior in regards to growing uh, intellects, 
and it was like part of yeah. you know the USSR's propaganda tools to always make sure that you know there was always a Russian uh, being uh, the world uh, chess uh, master at the time. But still, uh, it's not a negative thing, uh, even yeah, yeah. though the ambitions were arguably. Yeah, this competition uh, created uh, some great chess characters on both sides. So. Uh, in some ways, also good. Um, not in all ways, but still. Uh, so, Thomas, uh, who are the three people who have been the most influential for uh, for you? Yes, uh, uh, I was thinking a little bit about that, and you know, um, I might change my mind, but uh, I was trying to uh, imagine three people who had uh, done. Uh, significant amount of uh, impression on me personally, allowing me to change my zeitgeist, my outlook upon the world, so to speak. And uh, actually as number one, I have a living person, Alan Kay. Uh, he's quite old today, uh, but uh, he was uh, the guy behind small talk. And uh, especially in 1997, he held this uh, keynote speech for an hour and a half mm -hmm. at Utsla where he, uh, among other things, uh, spoke a lot about the creative process in general. And what's quite unique with Alan Kay is that he's actually not a uh, software developer by profession, <laughs> which is kind of weird, mm -hmm. because he's probably the greatest current living software developer out there, next to like Donald Knuth or something. Mm -hmm. This is actually um, a PhD. Uh, his PhD is in biology. Mm, yeah. And in addition, before he became a professional uh, computer uh, software scientist, he actually worked as a professional jazz guitar player. <laughs> mm. And these two very, very different uh, approaches to life allowed him to see software development from a completely different side. So he argued that instead of looking at these uh, systems as you know bits and bytes and stuff like mm -hmm. that, we might have huge benefits from imagining them from perspective of biology or music or art yeah, yeah. Or, or anything but software, really. And that made me completely change my my perception of my own uh, my own profession, so to speak. And allowed me to, to use things uh, such as, you know, and slowly over time teach myself how do I create rhythm in source code? You know, yeah. you have no, no, th there's no sound. Still, source code can have rhythm, you know. How do you uh, uh, create uh, the flexibility that biology gives you in your APRs, etc.? Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, person one. Second person is Steve Jobs, for obvious reasons. I guess he's on everybody's list. And the third person is Alan Turing. Not necessarily because he influenced me directly, but simply because it's impossible to not be influenced by him if you're doing software, since he arguably created and implemented and invented that, the first computer, and what later became our entire world. So, yeah, actually, uh, on Alan K, uh, uh, we need uh, this holistic view. Or it's often uh, forgotten, and uh, we are in this tunnel state when we just see something uh, forward, one small spot, and don't see all the picture. Yeah, I totally agree uh, uh, with you about that, and I think actually. Probably one of the most important things a software developer can do to actually grow as a software developer is to teach himself something completely irrelevant. Like meditation, paint, yeah. you know, fertilizing beer, wh whatever. Something that is completely unrelated to your actual field. Yes, it's yeah. very important because it's like um education from different perspectives that actually really help you as a person and in your professional stuff. I heard a um, couple of topics in that year about how uh, music and uh, music knowledge uh, helps in development also. Mm. 
Yeah, actually, it is the same. Uh, it is the same thing we're doing. If you're thinking about it, you know, source code. Uh, yeah. Arguably, isn't about having a computer do what you want it to do. Source code, conceptually, is about communications between two human beings. Right. That's what the purpose of source code is. The, the fact of that it's actually compiling and producing some sort of executable is just almost like a side effect, right? I mean, the, the obvious reasons why we invented higher and higher abstractions such as C++ and, you know, C Sharp and, and Lisp and these high level abstractions were because we needed the ability to understand what the developer before us had done to some sort of like project. And actually, that's the purpose with music too. You know, music is to communicate feeling from one human being yeah. to another. So it's actually very two related uh, subjects, even though obviously they seem to be completely unrelated. Yes, and actually this holistic view has a reflection on uh, our brain structure and how it develops. I recently I uh, read about uh, sensory deprivation uh, during childhood and uh, what it can produce. And uh, it's very, very important uh, for a child, for example, to uh, just feel something uh, like pain on, or joy, uh, tr uh, try uh, to touch uh, something like snow or dirt or something like that. And mm. uh, it just trains the neural network. I know, network. I know, because... that. The, the, the neurons you're, you're basically uh, teaching as you're touching things uh, such as clay or snow or water or these different sensory perceptions yes, uh, yes, also and, uh, facilitates for the development of your brain and you know your frontal cortex and everything really so everything yes, uh, that's a very good idea actually one thing software developers could do to actually increase their capacity to create brilliant software is simply to pack a bag and walk out in the forest and live in the forest for a week, <laughs> sleeping under you know, the moon. That will actually increase your ability to solve cognitive problems, even though it doesn't sound like it will so yeah. intuitively, but it actually will. Yeah. That's why it's important to, to have some uh, form of balance left anyway, to produce more, more efficiently the code and uh, all the results needed. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, what's the impo most important thing you have learned in your life? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, entering the now. You know oh, what? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, no, about the Buddhist. Uh, yeah, Can you please more, tell more about this uh, for our listeners? So. Yeah, uh, in the Buddhist worldview, they operate with uh, this concept called monkey mind. And basically what the monkey mind is, is a mind that is thinking. You think about tomorrow, what are you going to do tomorrow? You think about yesterday, what did you do yesterday? You think about your plans for the future, etc, etc. Now, the Buddhists will refer to that as a monkey mind, because it's always preoccupied, preventing the mind from having an experience of the now, of the world it is currently actually living in. And these experiences, which you can only have in the present, are actually what makes you alive. Because you can look at the door and you can enjoy its beautiful brown coloring or you know, the intricacies of its uh, locking mechanisms or the beauty of how the walls around it was created, etc., etc. And this becomes your quality of life, so to speak your ability to actually have an experience here and now, in this very, very second. But you cannot have that experience if you're constantly worrying about how to pay your bills, or if you're constantly worrying about if anybody's gonna tell everybody on Twitter that you behaved really stupid, you know, the last time you had a bottle of wine a week ago, etc., etc. So these worries creates a monkey mind. They do. Now, if you can leave that monkey mind behind and entering the now, the present, then you can have a much higher quality of life. So, and Eckhart Tolle, 
uh, wrote a book about it actually, which is called Entering the Now. So, or the power of now, sorry, the power of now. Yeah, it's a very nice concept and uh, it's uh, so inconvenient. Uh, it's so inconvenient, but uh, it's hard to uh, have it uh, translated through words. So it's uh, mainly experiencing. But, it's actually uh, very, very difficult to experience, and uh, the primary reason is arguably described in the path of the Buddha, where he had to conquer Demon Mara, and Demon Mara, of course, is the anthropomorphized version of his own fears which he realized uh, at the end of the process of conquering Demon Mara as he entered the cave and saw Demon Mara at the bottom, innermost hidden sanctuaries of where his fears were hiding. And then Demon Mara turned into this little boy, four years of age, actually being the Buddha himself. So at that point he realized that, hey, my fears is me. I am the one generating these fears and I don't need to. Right, because fear is what prohibits you from entering the now. Yeah, uh, and uh, it's really interesting from uh, uh, what uh, this European in origin uh, uh, think was translated in some way by uh, such minds in Western world to make it more uh, convenient to understand this thing. Mm. Uh, where it's is kind of. Book- um, Sorry, yeah, you go yeah. on. Uh, there is a book uh, named uh, Siddhartha, uh, which is was produced by uh, uh, in process. Is working with uh, Carl Jung actually. Mm. Uh, uh, this uh, book is written uh, by Hermann Hesse, uh, and uh, he had written the first part, and then with his stack and. Uh, in process of therapy with uh, Jung himself, uh, he got to uh, go through that blog. And after that, uh, this, uh, this book, Siddhartha, not only considered uh, just describing Eastern culture, but also extending it in some way. And it also considers this uh, state of now. Actually, uh, when you're talking about Siddhartha, by the way, uh, I mean, most people uh, have uh, heard about, you know, him as the Buddha. The Buddha is actually a title, and it means the awakened one, if you translate it literally into English. And actually, Eckhart Tolle, what he describes as, you know, entering the now, and a lot of other people too, I don't mean to, to... brag too much about Eckhart Tolle, there are thousands of others having had similar experiences. But that is basically what it translates into. It is the realization of that good God, there's a word out there, you know, good God, that tree is just spectacularly beautiful. Wow, this flower is stretching for the heavens, you know. You yeah. cannot do that if you have the monkey mind because the monkey mind obstructs your ability to actually recognizing the present and realizing it actually exists. Because the monkey mind always pushes you either back into your past experiences or into the fears of uh, your potential future experiences. So once you enter the now, you become the awakened one actually you do become truly awakened and you become what buddhism refers to as a buddha and this is something we can all achieve you don't have to be Gautama Siddhartha in order to to achieve this this is actually achievable for every single human being on the planet You, you just have to take off the baggage of fear you know we all have this we're born with this or we're not actually born with it but we're taught by society to fear this and that and everything and you know media scares the living crap out of us by you know always constantly trying to sell more newspapers based upon the belief that world war three is just around the corner and so on and so on and this creates a constant state of fear that prohibits our soul's ability to actually live 
So most people are actually, this is going to sound really ridiculous, but it's actually true. Most people are actually capable of completing an entire life without ever having lived for as much as one single second. And that is a statement I stand behind, actually. And that is really, really sad. Because the fear doesn't exist. You know? Demon Mara is just a construct of our minds. So, and you don't need her. There's no, nothing to be afraid of. So, and a lot of my reasons for having experienced this, I believe, is actually in regards to Sergei uh, and uh, his uh, opportunities in the future is actually due to, to having traveled, you know. And I traveled to Sonoma County in 2009 and I experienced uh, different cultures and, you know, different outlooks upon the world and so on and so on. And as I did, I realized that a lot of this artificial fear that was instilled into me by, you know, society around me was just that, artificial. You know, it, it didn't have a basis of reality. It didn't have uh, uh, the, the right to, to exist. Those things I had been taught to fear my entire life weren't things I really needed to fear. And as I did, I just kind of like realized that, you know, I don't need to carry this burden. <laughs> you don't need to carry fear, you know. And what was your life before uh, you learned it? Boom. Very, very fearful. Actually, I think Eckhart Tolle perfectly describes, describes this in his book. Eckhart Tolle, at age 27, was suicidal and wanted to end his life. And uh, as he was just about to, to slash his own wrists, he said to himself, I cannot live with myself. And as he did, he realized that there is a separation. Who is this I? And who is myself? And who is this I who cannot live with itself? Yeah. And as he did, actually, he arguably, from a psychological point of view, experienced death and he died there and then because he realized he no longer needed I. And he no longer needed myself. He no longer needed any of those artificial constructs. So he actually snuffed them. <laughs> While his body kept on living and his soul was arguably reborn. Yeah. So even uh, though it sounds like a lot of spiritual voodoo, magic, bullshit, rubbish, superstition and all of that stuff, it's really just psychology. You know? Yeah. Uh, and can you tell what uh, was your life like after learning it? Like that. It's changed. Like Eckhart Tolle. I wanted to die. You know? <laughs> I wanted to die. And I realized that I cannot live with myself anymore. I had, I, at that point, I hadn't read Eckhart Tolle's book at all. Didn't read it before, like, two, three years later down the road, at which point I realized that his experiences were echoing my own. So it but was an extremely it. dark place I was living in. I was having a nervous breakdown. I was uh, not willing to continue living uh, uh, the way I had been living. I was in a nightmarish, uh, artificially constructed reality imposed upon me by my brain's ability to fear all sorts of different things, which I, at the split second of a microsecond, realized. I no longer needed to feel. And what uh, was changed for better after you experienced it and learned it? Well, uh, first of all, I became more, you know, when, when you don't have fear, you're more truthful, <laughs> obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're more truthful, you tend to get better friends. I, I no longer have any of the friends I had before uh, I had this experience. And all of the friends I currently have today are more genuine, they're more real, uh, they're more compassionate and passionate about everything, life, whatever. Uh, I have a better life, really, in, in all ways. 
So I'm more genuine, uh, I'm more happy, etc., uh, etc. Et That's great. Um, and currently, in your current state, uh, what helps you relax and restore? What are, mm -hmm. are your tools, best ones? Uh, meditation, uh, music, I play several instruments, saxophone, guitar, uh, experiences with nature, experiences with um, others in my community where I live. Uh, it might be as uh, simple as, you know, bringing Lisbeth, my, my girlfriend, to a restaurant, having a nice dinner with her or going to the beach. And in addition to, of course, as has always been, uh, one of my passions, which is to create code, right? Beautiful yeah. code, either voluntarily in the weekends or as a part of my job. Yeah. Very nice. Mm, sounds um, fascinating. I actually I know a lot of people that um, cannot think even about um, next day so it's, uh, for someone it's really hard to just stop and start thinking uh, or not thinking at all <laughs> you know the the concept sergey is really simple actually you see when you experience that you know the rest of your life becomes a bonus right yes. now what i experienced uh, in 2011 was basically a that but it wasn't a physical death. I mean, I didn't slash, slash my wrists or, or anything like that. But it was a mental death, right? My, my previous persona, and persona is actually Greek and it means mask. And these are the masks we wear in society such that others can relate to us because it creates predictability in regards to our behavior. And obviously my mask was shattered. And I started behaving in a way that, you know, didn't, uh, wasn't coherent in regards to, you know, my peers' expectations about how I should behave. Because my entire self changed completely, which of course contributed to, to me losing a lot of my previous quote-unquote friends, which really weren't friends, really. But once you die, <laughs> once you experience that death, quote-unquote, then, you know, something else comes, you know, something else is born in its place. And you no longer fear death, right? And when you no, no longer fear death, you, you can't really fear anything, you know, right? I don't know if yeah. this makes sense or if I made a little bit uh, too much uh, out on the limb here, but uh, yeah. I'm Thomas. Uh... Uh, other than experiencing now, what is the simplest and most useful tool to increase your life level? What do you think? Balancing your brain. We have a, a type of job that is extremely cognitively uh, exhausting for our frontal cortex, right? Both me, yep. you and Sergey we're constantly expected to solve really, really complex and advanced logical problems uh, through source code and through our ability to think logically. And that creates what I like to refer to as a left hemisphere heavy mind, where you tend to bury yourself in logic. So I believe that balancing that out with something that is on the complete different side of the spectrum, if it's playing guitar, if it is playing saxophone, painting, working with clay or woodworks or whatever, I, I don't know, but it, but it has to be something that is completely free from all logical types of thinking, something that is pure, Creative, one yeah. way or another. That is my primary tool, I think, to achieve balance in life. Yeah, very nice. Uh, uh, 
what uh, what is uh, some advice uh, what do you give to someone wanting to enter your professional field? <laughs> uh, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Uh, you know what? I was thinking a lot about that question as you sent me the agenda, and I I, I was like, you know, thinking about it. Uh, yeah, you know what? Uh, I should answer. Uh, yeah, I can't explain why because I would be violating probably dozens of non-disclosure agreements if I try to explain why or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> 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 Which arguably explains why. <laughs> yeah, so so. I uh, simply uh, stating it's uh, some uh, red tapes as you as you say some uh, restrictions what uh, don't help it us to become to, more creative it tends to destroy I mean by, by all means I I love my work uh, I love uh, creating software uh, I love solving problems uh, don't get me wrong um, I do love my work and you know we're blessed with for the most parts at the very least great colleagues and and stuff like that um, but there is a when we're talking about the fintech industry and this is something you are going to experience to Sergey as you move to to uh, the valley because uh, it's not only uh, in the fintech industry you find these uh, things uh, it's in everything relating to software, uh, so to speak, because I mean, software is the new church of the 21st millennium. There's no arguing in that, and we are the new priesthood. And you know, 99.99% .99 of all the powers on the planet is arguably, you know, centered around NASDAQ 10, top 10 companies. And it tends to destroy your illusions. You know, we, if you if you want to live a life uh, with pink clouds and you know teddy bears and you know beautiful flowers and stuff <laughs> like uh, that, then you know, the closer you yeah, the closer you come to to the inner circles of powers, the the, the more that illusion will will collapse. So. Yeah. Uh, and you are more. going to experience that, Sergey. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So, I understand the risk. I already source uh, and uh, look for a lot of information about life of style. I mean, lifestyle in that region and about how people behave, what they think, why they think. I uh, try to. Um, no, as much as possible, and also I know that a lot of people going back uh, <laughs> um, from after a couple of years because um, some, some some rule and regulation in that region. But in general, I I fascinated to pass through it. Uh, I think it will be I will better as person <laughs> as I see this. Uh, one thing uh, you should realize uh, specifically, uh, which is going to be uh, a cultural challenge for you, Sergey, uh, as far as I know at the very least, is that uh, in America everybody will smile at you and everybody will, will uh, laugh at you. Uh, this is not because they are disrespecting you, uh, which I realize it would be perceived as in Moscow or St. Petersburg, probably. But it's just a part of their differences, you know, it's just how society works over there. Yes, They're not laughing at you, really. Uh, <laughs> it's their culture. So, you know, if you want to, like, you know, mentally prepare yourself for the cultural differences, uh, my advice to you is to spend uh, 20 minutes in front of the mirror every day for a month or something, uh, practicing smiling at yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but, but not. Yes, uh, yes. I, I, uh, I uh, heard a lot of about that uh, from uh, how to say from interviewers, Russian interviewers on on, on Silicon Valley side. They always uh, uh, try. To, when you prepare for interview, they always try to advise you that you should uh, be more positive, smile, and so on. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yes, it's, 
<laughs> in, in America, though, it goes. I mean, in Russia, it's not common to smile at uh, strangers. It's perceived as being rude. In America, it goes the complete other way, right? It's a fake smile, though. It's a society that is built upon hypocrisy through to the bone. So a person who really wants to possibly, I don't know, maybe murder you and boil you and eat you alive, will still smile through his teeth and say, yeah, call me, let's go out and do something <laughs> fun. And then he really wants to murder you, right? <laughs> I mean, there's a reason why California has the strongest, uh, the, the, the highest the statistical probability of uh, serial killers on the planet compared to any other wow. regions on this planet. Mm. Yeah, and it's because of that hypocrisy has gone through society, through to the bone. Where, where you know you you tend to it's like a form of like self-inflicted happy madness, you know. Yeah, but so, uh, anyway, uh, not uh, all Russians are groomy, and not all U.S. citizens are uh, hypocritical. I think. No, or, no, no. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I I didn't mean to to generalize here at all, but. Uh, but uh, this is one of the key differences between a city like Moscow and a city like San Francisco. Yeah, but anyway, you can construct your own uh, community for some time, yeah. if you try. So, I think... Anyway, but uh, it's good advice to check out. Mm. Uh, what uh, are good, uh, Thomas, what are good recommendations in, uh, you hear? In your profession or area of expertise, pretty good. So, advice. could you repeat? Could you repeat the question? What are good recommendations you hear in your profession or area of expertise? What are good documentations? No, no, no good uh, recommendations. Ah, oh, recommendations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, advice. Uh, pretty good ooh. tools to use. I wish I had some. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any for me? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's uh, anyway good to have something like dry or solid or etc. But maybe some good advice what is... Well, to here's one. Improve. I started creating code when I was eight and it uh, rapidly turned into an obsession, right? Yeah. Now, if you really want to, to, to make it as a software developer, you know, you, you, you can't choose to do it at the age of 21 because you were enrolled at the college thinking that, hey, salaries are great in software development. Okay. If you do, you're going to be unhappy and you're going to become one of the 98% of software developers on the planet who arguably produces more bad than good. Uh, you know, it, this is like playing the violin, you yeah. know. Yeah, it's like a, it's a calling, or it's like you know being a priest. It's a calling. If if you don't have the calling, then you know, do something else. <laughs> you know, please. There's 26 million of us already. You know, there's way too many of us. You know, 98 percent of these guys aren't producing anything. You know, more valuable than you know whatever crap they're leaving behind in the toilet baskets at night. You know. So Please, good don't advice become here. one of those. Yeah, yeah, I think it's good advice here. Uh, or think again, maybe you shouldn't be in this field. As I hear it. <laughs> Thomas, uh, can I uh, interrupt you guys? Uh, Thomas, what yeah. do you think about general like IT teams? I mean, uh, software development is so huge now. I mean, in, in the world scale, there are a lot of specialties like designers, uh, UI, um, how to say, UI testers. I mean, not uh, uh, not relational to test. I mean, uh, test with users. How it uh, sound correctly? Can't remember. And yeah. uh, managers, scrum masters, uh, tons of specialities in IT sphere. Well, it's um, a natural human reaction. You know, people with power as they see new structures for power uh, arising, uh, their general knee-jerk reaction is to do what Caesar did 2,000 years ago, 
which is to attempt to, to control it. And the primary means of doing that, of course, is to exercise, divide and conquer, right? Such that, you know, you can more easily facilitate for having small, tiny specialist sections that cannot coexist without, you know, the hub of the wheel being, of course, the leader or whatever, controlling everything uh, as a whole. You know. Yeah, but but uh, yes, I uh, agree. But uh, I think there is also natural reaction. Uh, everything that you shouldn't shade when it uh, becomes big enough, and here uh, as uh, the world becomes based on software more and more, uh, as some uh, some atmospheres uh, are no twenty uh, words meaning snow as now we have uh, this differentiation because some uh, professions of old are becoming becoming uh, useless in its own way and some more IT related fields are becoming new, uh, useful. Yes, uh, but at the same time there is like this uh, fracturing component occurring too, right? I mean, if you look at somebody like Google being the primary example, I mean, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, they had this amazing little equation called PageRank and they went to Yahoo and they offered Yahoo to buy it for $100,000 and Yahoo laughed them out of the door uh, to the point where Sergey and Larry figured, you know what, we can create a better search engine and they did and three years later, Google was worth more than, than Yahoo. Yeah. Now at this point, of course, Google's primary enemy is the next smart guy, being just as smart as Larry and Sergey, right? Okay. So they're trying to tighten the hole behind them, so to speak, so that you know nobody else are capable of crawling through that same hole and doing the same disruptive thing over again, etc. At which point their primary mechanism to do so is the same mechanism for control we've had in societies for, for thousands of years, which is divide and conquer, right? So you divide everything up into smaller and smaller pieces. As you do that, you, you tend to fracture things. I, I kind of meet myself a little bit in the door here, though, too, I, I must confess as I am saying this, because I have always been attacked for my inability to create UX, even though I think my UX is like the best in the world. But everybody who knows anything about UX, they look at my UX and they say, good God, man, you need a UX engineer. <laughs> <laughs> and they're probably right. So I don't know, maybe it's just like my software development autistic brain telling me that this is perfect while well, it's really not. But, but you know, so I tend to meet myself a little bit in the door here as I'm arguing this, but, but I don't believe in those extreme specializations. I believe, you, you know, Einstein wasn't really good at math, you know. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was a painter, you know, still he, he constructed, you know, flying wheels, mm -hmm. things like that. I don't really believe in specializations, really. I, I, I believe in that, you know, you, you, you should attempt at being that jack of all trades, even though that is arguably today a curse word because if you're a jack of all trades you're the specialist of none i actually don't believe in that i'm a specialist in software development because of that i play the saxophone because of that i am uh, painting with acrylics because of that i'm taking long hikes in the forests every now and then etc yeah does that make sense yeah sure yes it's Sounds really uh, good, uh, really expensive. It's uh, probably something uh, to think about. Uh, yes. And what do uh, you think is uh, what are your best tips for making uh, the world a better place? Entering the now. <laughs> Entering. And other than that. Uh, there is no fear but fear, really. You know, the only fear you really have to fear is fear itself. Yeah. You see, every single friction point in society between individuals within it are arguably based upon fear. 
either fear of that that guy's gonna kill me that uh, results in you know preemptive strikes ending up in killing him or fear of that the neighbor's gonna steal your girlfriend or your car or your house or is gonna poop in your backyard or whatever etc it's all based upon fear every single friction point we have once you realize that your fear is no longer justified then you live in paradise we we have paradise this is paradise you know prophet muhammad was asked where is jannah and that is arabic for paradise and then he said that underneath uh, your mother's uh, feet well what is underneath your mother's feet you know, well, the same thing that is underneath everybody else's feet. The earth, here and now. That is paradise. And just as I said that, the sun broke out through the clouds. Here inside. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, very nice. I, I agree with you. Uh, mm. But one thing is that you cannot force everybody to enter now. What, uh, no, but it's infectious. It's infectious. Actually, you know, entering the now is like a disease. It's like a virus. Once you yep. start treating it and you start living it, it starts spread from host to host. So it's like yep. a, it's like a virus. So if you are capable of actually achieving it from an individual point of view, then you're going to infect people around you with it. Yeah. And as you do, your world becomes paradise. Does that make sense? Yeah, very nice. And everybody who's willing to and wants to are welcome to join your paradise. Yeah. And other than uh, entering the now uh, and all exercises uh, not related to the uh, field, uh, what uh, concrete practical in the uh, last five years? Uh, what are the new beliefs, behaviors, or habits what's most improved your life, other than what you said uh, before that? Thinking outside of the box. In uh, magic, obviously, which uh, is this automation tool which I've created, mm -hmm. is uh, this programming language called Hyper Lambda. It sounds like uh, a hyped name. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> but actually it uh, has some actual merits. Now, as I constructed it, I realized I don't need OOP, I don't need types, I don't need the separation between data and logic. If I don't do that separate data and logic, I all of a sudden have the mechanism to mutate my logic as my logic is executing, etc., etc. And that resulted in the ability to literally click a button and crudify an entire existing database into HTTP REST CRUD endpoints. <coughs> and um, the only reasons why I was capable of doing that was because I had no concept, I had no uh, uh, color, I had no, no uh, assumptions about how a programming language should be. Uh, I completely dropped uh, 80 years of so-called quote-unquote best practices uh, when I constructed it and it resulted in a language which was purely functional in its design where there were no classes, uh, every single function is globally accessible, you know, it, it's, I mean, from a best practices point of view, it sounds like a nightmare, it sound, sounds like a big ball of mud. But actually, from a practical <laughs> point of view, as yeah. you actually start consuming it and you start using it, you realize, good God, this isn't a big ball of mud. This is actually the cure for the big ball of mud. And my facilitator for being able to actually implement that was to completely forget about what everybody told me were best practices. And in many ways, these experiences echoes the experiences of Bruce Lee, who all of a sudden woke up one day and realized, you know what? Screw all concepts, screw all styles. You know, there is no style. His own martial arts, uh, Jet Kundu, something, was based upon that there doesn't exist a best style. There is no such thing as a style. Once you start having a fighting style, you 
restrict yourself because whatever you need there and then when you're fighting kung fu depends upon whatever situation you are in and whatever opponent you are meeting so there doesn't exist any best practices there, uh, you know, my, my, the worst types of blogs I ever read are the ones that are named the, the five most important things you need to know about X, Y, Z. Forget about it. <laughs> Forget about it, you know. Just like, throw it out. It's garbage. They're all wrong. You're right. <laughs> Actually, it uh, reminds me of, on how one of uh, considered words of language has become one of most popular and uh, very useful. You know, I mean about JavaScript, which was yeah. just <laughs> very lame and then became very great in some ways, in some applications. Well, it's the by far most used software development programming language on the planet by like an order of magnitude next to number two on the list or something, right? Still, you... according to conventional theory, it's the worst programming language ever and I actually know Brandon Ike and I told him once that uh, I actually replied him on Twitter and he said something like yeah I made uh, JavaScript in three weeks and then he actually replied me and answered and corrected me it wasn't three weeks it was 11 days <laughs> <laughs> and this is the most popular programming language on the planet and the dude did it in 11 days you know yeah, simplicity, nothing conventional. Yeah, and, but he violated something. As he did, he violated every single best practice or industry has ever imagined. But nowadays, uh, there are a lot of laws about TypeScript, stake checking, and still, uh, best practices uh, they exist, but I. Um, love to thinking about this from a mathematical perspective. Uh, every uh, function has the uh, working area, so we just need to know what uh, working area for the for one particular best practice. One when it's working, when it's not working, then yeah. it's very clean, clearly to Yeah, apply. and JavaScript is painful, uh, Sergey. <laughs> It is very, very painful, I agree. But, but at the same time, it has been the facilitator of literally creating an entirely new axiom of application development. And then adding TypeScript on top of it, obviously, significantly improves it. And, you know, as uh, Anders um, Heilsberg uh, says, the guy behind TypeScript, he says that, you know, we created TypeScript such that it should be possible to, to create web applications with millions of lines of, of code, uh, which he believes correctly, by the way, may I add, is not possible to do today with JavaScript because of, you know, all of its weirdities and, and stuff like that. Uh, but still, TypeScript is built on top of JavaScript, right? Yeah. So I mean, even every single time you're using TypeScript, it's transpiles down to JavaScript. So you're still using JavaScript, you know. Yeah. And so in a way, that, that there's just no no way of beating it, right? I mean, even if TypeScript wins, JavaScript still wins, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just another abstraction on top of JavaScript, making it slightly more conforming, making it slightly more rigid, making it slightly more traditional. For, and especially for backend developers. <laughs> yeah. And I love TypeScript too, by the way, for the record. I, I exclusively use TypeScript. I, I don't use JavaScript anymore, unless I absolutely have to. But so, uh, we are living in an era when uh, uh, meaning of words change as we uh, say them, and so JavaScript uh, nowadays is uh, uh, nothing. Nothing we think about it actually, because uh, already a new ECMA script standard came out. Everything has changed, and anyway, uh, JavaScript already changed by itself, not only by TypeScript. 
It did, it did. And it improved. And, you know, sure, there are some places they can't improve it, such that, you know, for instance, the scope of variables inside of, you know, for loops, etc., because they're globally scoped within the function, they're declared within, etc., etc. Creating all of these weirdities, which again, though, TypeScript yet again fixes by introducing new keywords such as let and const, etc., allowing you to actually scope your variable inside of your for loop, etc., etc. So, yes, uh, it is changing to the better, and some of the places it cannot ever change, but the places where it cannot ever change is fixed by yet another layer of abstraction, Yalua, which always seems to fix the rubbish of the past somehow magically <laughs> so by the way uh, thomas do you uh, heard about a rock star a language uh, since you have musician background maybe you have experience with it as uh, a create, creator uh, visit novosibirsk um, in current year um, uh, provide uh, some performance <laughs> on the oh. general idea is is, is creating music uh, via um, language language operation wow Somebody that's a, that's an interesting combination no i i yeah. haven't uh, heard of it but uh, i'll definitely check it out what was its name rockstar yes yes the main uh, how they um, became. Um, there are a lot of misconceptions about Rockstar developers, uh, at least in past, uh, in um, for human uh, resource management. Uh, there are a lot of vacations was posted with titles like Rockstar developer. We need only Rockstar developers and um, something like that. So um, one of the British um, um, how to say it? CEO. Yeah. He, so one man uh, just uh, came up with idea create language that uh, called a rock star. So uh, <laughs> so that now uh, it can be real programming languages and can be real uh, vacations. <laughs> Nice. Well, I obviously uh, enjoy the combination of uh, uh, creativity and intuition and, you know, the right hemisphere with, you know, the logics of the left hemisphere and trying to, to create combinations uh, between the two hemispheres that, you know, in their combined efforts produce as offspring of their own. So, I mean, from a philosophical point of view, it sounds very interesting for me to, to combine those two things together, you know, programming, language and music and creativity. So yeah. uh, it sounds like an interesting uh, thing. So definitely. Yes, you should try. Uh, okay, uh, Timothy, um, what? Yeah. Uh, what uh, a couple of questions uh, on our list uh, what is uh, one of the best or, or most worthwhile investments you uh, ever uh, uh, worthwhile had? My, uh, so, uh, sorry Tim worthwhile uh, what investments ah investments yeah, yeah. my microphone oh yeah <laughs> uh, I have a condenser microphone for like 125 euros which I just simply adore because uh, I use it to create my uh, magic uh, YouTube videos and it improves the quality of my speech uh, significantly and uh, I use it in such a regard for my left hemisphere type of work in addition to that, every now and then, one of my hobbies is to record videos and mix them in GarageBand and stuff like that, you know, recording myself either playing saxophone or guitar or singing or something. So uh, it gives me a great pleasure. It's about uh, 10 centimeters uh, tall. 
I'm not sure if I should uh, mention its brand, even though. Because yeah, you, you can. Uh, it's no problem. And uh, if, uh, uh, if some of listeners we want to know about real investments uh, or something like that, uh, it will be good. Yeah, to... it's it's a Studio XLR iRig mic microphone, and it's a okay. condenser microphone. So it uh, my version requires an external sound card. So I have like this small sound card uh, that I put up next to my Mac, which is called Euphoria uh, UMC22. It's quite old, produced by Behringer. But that allows me to connect it to GarageBand, which is just a spectacular piece of tool if you're a musician. And uh, that allows me to have lots and lots and lots of fun. I just simply adore my microphone. So all of my latest music videos on my um, uh, channel where I'm playing the guitar and singing are recorded with that microphone. So, and it's 125 euros or something. So, yeah, by the way, last song was great. Yeah. What? Uh, by the way, uh, your last song was great. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you. So, and uh, uh, something like that. Uh, other than micro, what uh, was some of purchase of uh, 200 dollars or less? Because most positively impact your life in the last six months or only rest of memory. You can maybe uh, specific brand model uh, how to find it in the problem. Well, <coughs> this is a thing I, I actually didn't buy and I still haven't gotten around to using it because unfortunately I don't have time. But probably the gadget I have, which I am actually the most enthused about conceptually from a philosophical point of view, is actually my Raspberry Pi, which actually you gave to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of unfair to, to, because I didn't, you know, invest a single nickel in it, so to speak. And I really, really wish I had more time because I would just simply adore playing with it. And of course, what I would do with it is to, you know, turn it into a web server, uh, you know, creating some sort of like DNSA record leading home to my personal IP address, probably setting up magic or something like that. And, you know, for people wanting to have fun with software development, you know, Raspberry yeah. Pi's are, you know, that is a spectacular value proposition for the creative mind uh, who wants to play around with the software yeah. development from like a non-professional point of view. That is just like the Lego of the 21st century, if you ask me. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and actually, uh, it's uh, pretty powerful for its size. It can yeah. run, run uh, for example, uh, I don't know, Minecraft or emulators of some of, uh, gaming system. It's actually kind of funny from a personal perspective too, because actually that Raspberry Pi was the kick in the butt I needed to, to really start, you know, wrapping up magic and continue my, my work on it. Because uh, I wanted to create something that I could deploy on the Raspberry Pi. And after a while, you know, the project kind of like grew to such an extent that, you know, now it's like a professional commercial, you know, framework and library. So now it's Great. arguably outgrown the Raspberry Pi before I even had time ever to install it upon it. Though. So that's kind of like unfair, some people might argue. But uh, so that Raspberry Pi has uh, meant uh, incredibly much for me personally because it, it, it made me pick up magic and continue the work on it, so... Yeah, appreciate that. Mm. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> and uh, one last question on our list. Uh, if you could have dinner with any three people, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Yeah, so obviously this would probably be similar to the other lists. Uh, right, who are the three people I, uh, who have influenced me the most? And the answer to that question was Alan Kay and Steve Jobs and uh, Alan Turing. However, uh, this time I wouldn't invite Steve Jobs simply because he has a <laughs> by nature. <laughs> Not because I don't admire him, because I deeply admire him. I but I imagine that if I invited him for dinner, 
then everything would be centered around him. <laughs> now, if I invited Alan Kay, I'd probably get an incredibly interesting discussion about, you know, biology versus uh, software versus jazz guitar playing styles, uh, etc., etc. So uh, it wouldn't necessarily be the people uh, whom I admired most. I guess that yeah, was yeah. my point of view. But uh, definitely Alan Kay. So because of our very similar types of outlooks and to life and software development in general. Yeah. So besides, very I think nice. I'd love to show him Hyperlambda. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, uh, that's all on our list. Uh, we, can, we will continue with news. Uh, for now, uh, do you want to participate or you can uh, leave and listen uh, then <laughs> after a podcast will come out? No, it's fine. I think I'll uh, log off. So, but uh, okay, thank okay. you, Sergey and uh, Tim. So, yeah, thank you have so a much. Good, well, you too, yes. Wonderful conversation. Amazing. Thank you, thank you. It didn't... Uh, Very glad to hear you. I mean, we barely mentioned magic in there, but uh, it, w- it was a nice podcast, I think. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, thank you. It was nice meeting you, Sergey. Have a safe journey to the Americas. <laughs> thank so, you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. okay. Bye. Cheers, guys. Okay, Timothy. Uh... Let's talk about Google. Yeah. <laughs> Do you hear about that uh, last news a lot? Yeah, yeah. No, it was the news uh, as uh, something like uh, Wari and Sergey are going out with all something like ending of career, but I go to source, uh, where uh, letters, etc. And uh, it's uh, nothing, nothing, mm, I don't know. It's just just we change uh, the active position as cells and giving it to alphabet cell Sandar Pichai uh, current uh, Google cell so nothing new actually nothing special they just uh, uh, will be having slightly le- uh, less active position now they still on the uh, uh, board uh, as a chief, um, you just know. I... Okay, okay. <laughs> what, what do you think about this one? Um, from uh, where, when I <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe uh, just uh, one, but <laughs> maybe it's just uh, some row one thirty in, one thirty out, something like that. <laughs> I uh, also actually don't uh, didn't find any uh, uh, void. Uh, any stuff that can be worried, it's just um, something changing inside of company's policies, probably. Or, uh, and maybe it uh, has some uh, influence on uh, financial market activities, uh, how um, stocks and their price both for Alphabet and Google, maybe it can influence on it, but uh, for general for uh, general software engineers, uh, it's probably uh, haven't uh, had a lot of influence. Mm-hmm. But uh, what I also heard about, I just continue for another topic uh, about have said cryptocurrency as you know uh, there are a lot of <laughs> players in that market already uh, and if you talk about uh, telegram and Pavel uh, Durov, they also have uh, he also have plan uh, to integrate uh, all cryptocurrency in uh, messenger but yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, he also have been troubled by uh, US government and he have some uh, court issues and uh, as I understand in general uh, current uh, government positions they try to stop uh, every uh, cryptocurrency activity 
and probably for creating some regulation mechanism or for all reasons probably somehow to uh, split markets in such a way that government also have will have a lot of profit from it not just uh, separated companies mm-hmm. what do you think yeah uh, currently actually uh, some countries are trying to create their own uh, cryptocurrencies and mainly uh, it's problem of organizations uh, to make it happen uh, we actually have some mistakes in delivering that and uh, one of uh, cryptocurrencies petro is not considered in cryptocurrency actually now because it's uh, considered it will it is more like some way of uh, uh, state to scam uh, their citizens because actually there was no emission of this cryptocurrency but it officially exists and uh, could be used like but at all uh, so uh, and what's about uh, China uh, what do you think um, do you ask about what uh, China and cryptocurrency how they uh, current state in the technology yeah um, there are probably uh, they can have a lot of profit from it uh, because they have uh, a good uh, technology base and good economics and the state of regulation of economics in uh, have such way that um, probably they can uh, provide more influence on uh, cryptocurrency usage it have both cons and pros uh, it's actually more related how uh, how more related how people it can it, it you use and what people uh, have influence on it I mean uh, if you don't try to got personal uh, profit uh, from uh, new technologies probably it, it will have more chance to be uh, used for for good for majority yep yeah actually uh, it's uh, there are some problems uh, in delivering cryptocurrencies for uh, day-to-day usage and we will see what will happen next um, okay uh, what you else know about uh, cryptocurrency in china have they um, tested or used it already? Um, actually, uh, there are some rumors what uh, uh, China has uh, Facebook, Libra as a partner, but it's not. Uh, I'm not sure uh, we can believe all those rumors. There are some uh, sources out there. Yes, especially, so, uh, especially uh, one of the uh, how to say it, uh, last policy of China. I mean, recent policy of China. It's uh, the same as for Russia. It's uh, own pro- own software. Even Huawei, uh, Huawei, uh, or how to how to correct it, uh, pronounce uh-huh. it. Uh, Huawei company. They. Uh, uh, create own uh, operational system for mobile phones <laughs> and they um, also I mean China try to invest in all in software development to replace uh, US uh, dependency yep 
for uh, their uh, payments uh, in China, there are two uh, hugest platform now. It's Alipay and WeChat Pay, and we are uh, pretty uh, uh, pretty frequently used now. Uh, almost everything could be both to the, the systems. Especially WeChat Pay is uh, very popular. Uh, almost everyone uh, can wear chat account. Uh, being uh, like to to sell some stuff. Uh, so like it's it's not joke now. But some grandma can have uh, this WeChat uh, account to sell something like uh, I don't know some flower seeds, something like that. Yes, yes. So we will see. All right. Yes, uh, it's very uh, interesting. Uh, it's really interesting to observe a current state in that area because uh, it has a lot of. It can ha- have a lot of influence uh, on current world. Uh, in some regions, uh, there is no a lot of authorities for U.S. dollars and for other uh, currencies, and probably uh, uh, using um, the online um, currency will uh, somehow integrate such regions in uh, worldwide economy. Uh, actually, Venezuela. Uh... Petro uh, thing uh, is uh, mirrors how it all work in Israel actually, because uh, you know about Israel uh, we have a big crisis, so, uh, we're failing yes. value of money, yes. etc. And uh, Petro shows uh, how it's not uh, all going well because they cannot organize themselves. Uh, this uh, currency Petro is just not uh, they even cannot change with transl- one uh, of translations to update it to current versions of white paper. Uh, such small things just show how we cannot organize this. And if they can't uh, organize this simple thing as uh, distributing on the internet, uh, how we can organize something like uh, crimes to be prevented to something like that real things in the world. So it uh, shows us uh, how inefficient governments can uh, make harm to citizens just by not doing their work well. Currently, it's just a uh, big story about this uh, crisis and this uh, pretty depressing. The amount of concerns here. Okay, uh, let's go to uh, next thing. Uh, we have Horowitz interview and we are for cows. What do you want to... Uh, what is more interesting, do you think? About VR? Um, can you... VR, uh, we are for cows. Uh, not, um, um, not really. Um, I read about in past days. Could you uh, describe what it's what's going on for yeah just uh, in uh, Moscow area is now uh, VR uh, glasses are tested on calls uh, ah, ah, oh okay yes yes I, I, I remember it yes. <laughs> it's very uh, uh, funny <laughs> from a people point of view because uh, regular citizens can afford to buy a VR but <laughs> It's going for cows. Yeah, uh, actually, real matrix now. Right? So, uh, if uh, if in in maybe a few generations it could be even something standard for just some people. So, uh, testing on cows it just shows how someone can be uh, put into this uh, like artificial paradise. I were really on a, in some field with the bad weather, etc. And uh, they say that our cows are actually producing better milk, best like uh, just because they are more happy now. Do you think it's uh, 
um, such information can be trusted or just for marketing for invest more in VR? I, I'm not sure it uh, is on a higher scale, but what it's uh, tested in some ways is uh, I think actually real. We have some photos, uh, we have some info about who organized it. Maybe not on a higher scale, but if it will work in some way, it, uh, I think it will be used somewhere else. Maybe just testing now, but it can be used. Yes, yes, probably. Yeah, there is uh, some uh, short story about a uh, program- programmer uh, who didn't receive his uh, special service on the workplace. And uh, it's right in, in some way what you think, but it's uh, the special service is something like a sex service, uh, like for uh, best employees or something like that. But uh, then you understand what it was just a message or something like that. And after that, in the end of the story, it's, uh, you are understanding what actually he is in some uh, bionic with liquid. Uh, he is uh, just in like matrix, and uh, all these uh, massage uh, masseurs or uh, something like special services and his work, all everything is inside this. It's just no nothing real. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. Uh, but thank God we are not uh, in this situation. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you? Uh, do you hear about uh, how to say the results of Amazon content that was uh, have been finished uh, on the past weeks? There are a lot of uh, new services that they opened, and one of them also related to uh, quantum computing. So. They really want to use quantum computing uh, in, cl- in, in the cloud. And they open such a service. Uh, as I understand, um, we can try to do some quantum computation. And uh-huh, uh-huh. we can participate in creating uh, quantum computing in their uh, labs. And also one of the options for collaboration. So uh, in general, there is series that people can use, and there is opportunity to collaboration in different ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, we can use it. Uh, uh, but uh, what is the price for now? Continue. Uh, they only announce it, and uh, price <laughs> they not discussed. Uh, so I not so it yet. And also, it's uh, as I understand, it's open for US region. So probably uh, we can test it via proxy or uh, try to use some kind of um, servers in that located in US. So it's also mm. not for okay. Uh, you can go. On. Yeah, I think uh, currently it's uh, more than uh, more. It's buzzwords mainly, and uh, after some time it will become real thing, solving some problems in mathematics or something like that, and then some practical areas. But for now, I think it's more of a buzzword because uh, IBM tried to be first. Now Google say they uh, have this supremacy, and uh, Amazon tries to uh, leverage that because uh, Google has uh, this. Uh, computers actually for a pretty long time when they both uh, this quantum computer uh, firm uh, so we just uh, as I know uh, deliver uh, like time on their on the service based on this uh, type of machines yes. interesting part that uh, and there are a lot of players on that market but uh, I heard that only uh, Amazon announced uh, how they plan to use this, that technology. Other companies, um, uh, at least Google, I know, 
from their um, um, showcase of quantum computing, they not talk about how they plan to use such technology. They just talk about that it can be used, but they not announce how they plan about that. Yeah, actually, I think it's because uh, Amazon is pretty good at scaling and providing uh, this such type of services. And other companies are mainly work uh, for uh, on this product for uh, such markets as uh, other big companies, such as Amazon, for example. And here maybe uh, some of Amazon services actually uh, use this Google uh, big quantum servers. Yes, yes, that's possible. Uh, Maybe just uh, this uh, different consumer, but because we are not uh, uh, hearing so much about that. And also, okay, it's yes. yeah, it's also important for them to talk about such things uh, because it uh, influences the stock price for their companies. So we should yeah, announce what we about. Uh, Okay, go, go on, go on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, other uh, pretty positive thing uh, is uh, news about 3D hologram, uh, which uh, used simple technologies, simple to CRT monitor back in the days. Uh, mm -hmm. It has uh, some small bit, which is uh, lighted by lasers very, very fast, uh, and moved by this bit moved by ultrasound. So it's a real 3D screen, a real 3D hologram. Uh, flickering is not visible, only uh, when you uh, record it on uh, some frequencies. But uh, for a human eye, just a real hologram, which can also uh, produce sounds, actually, not only uh, visual things. It's very interesting in the video, we show something like butterflies or something like that but it can produce a very interesting thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah. this, yeah, this uh, alt ultrasound is not um, dangerous. They can uh, take a bit by their, uh, their hands, nothing happens. Uh, I think uh, something like that will hit market soon. Uh, currently, uh, in this current VR technology, uh, we are pretty stuck because uh, it's, it's good, but uh, not as good as sh it should be. For uh, mm, it's uh, for now too, he too heavy, not so effective as uh, some other uh, mediums. So I hope it will all uh, will be become better. But AR, we are in such uh, hologram. Yes, um, if you remember, uh, in Japan, uh, actually, there are some concerts with hologram uh, singers. They yeah, actually yeah, yeah. did it. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, That's on Miko, da? That's on Miko. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Just interesting. What taking so long <laughs> if technology exists for a couple of years? Hey, it's a different kind of type of uh, technology, as you know. It's uh, pretty solid, not uh, so transparent. So, uh, but I I'm not sure about this uh, Bacaloid, uh, Hatsune Miku, uh, not sure about them. Uh, I think they may be great, but I, I know so so way by my eyes, <laughs> myself. So, maybe interesting to see it. Yes, and uh, yes. you know about this uh, Michael Jackson concert also when he already died and uh, he had a concert as a hologram. I didn't get that. Yes, I think Yeah. Uh, if you maybe I uh, not remember correctly, uh, do you remember about um Gear and when we go into the that forum in, in, in the past days, uh, the, the, there was some Russian startup that actually also tried to do something with hologram screen. <laughs> yeah. 
not sure that I understand what you're talking about. I mean, uh, in our country, uh, there was some startup that also ah, yeah, to achieve Ah, yeah, yeah, I remember now. Of... Mm. Yes. Yeah, it was, it was a sad story in some way. Uh, it was one of uh, popular uh, projects. Uh, they used steam and, uh, and light. Uh, pretty yes. good technology is something uh, like the military of US had. Uh, but they uh, had one problem. It's, uh, it was too... Uh, it has uh, high price for the market. And they uh, got funding. And when uh, funds get out, uh, they cannot continue this project. It's just, it just finished like that. Because they had no money and not uh, got to market. Pretty sad story, but maybe maybe something good from that uh, occurred because uh, some testing uh, took place. So someone can continue this in some yes, time. Yes, it's better. pretty good. The technology still evolve and we can um, touch. <laughs> it. Yeah, actually about VR. Uh, now it's considered. Uh, it seems uh, next few years will be rise of uh, this in the uh, gaming industry. I mean, uh, it will be used you know, on uh, higher scales. Uh, and one of the uh, things what we will demonstrate this, I hope it will be uh, Half-Life next uh, VR uh, game. Because we want to make it happen and uh, it will be a big thing as it was uh, with the Source engine before. Uh, so we can change something about the industry. And the Wolf yes. Corporation also has their own uh, VR device. Right. And uh, the, for, for the couple of past days, there was announcement of new Chrome version, which actually have support of VR and AR. So Chrome? it's yes, yes, in one yeah, version. It, yes, standard probably got uh, stabil stabilized and it can be used now. Mm. And how it looked like? Uh, I'm not uh, currently tried, but I really fascinated to try. Probably I tried in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, okay. We will see about that. Uh, one, a couple of things I uh, want to discuss uh, is. Uh, uh, Tell what we are supporting, uh, EK, on uh, the engines thing, and uh, some story about uh, uh, Robert Schlegel. Uh, what I also put in news. Have you seen it? About Robert Schlegel, uh, unfortunately, no. Yeah, it's uh, Robert Alexandrovich Schlegel uh, was a Russian political. Uh, political figure, former member of Russian State Duma, member of United uh, Russia. Uh, he recently became the citizen of Germany. Mm. He said what he is uh, not fun, not in front of uh, Russian politics now. Uh, he who was one of co-author of uh, Yarovoy, Law, uh, Law of Digma, Yakovlev, uh, and now he tells uh, in an interview uh, to uh, to German magazine Süddeutsche uh, Zeitung uh, what uh, he wants uh, for his kids to be rising in Germany. Uh, actually, uh, from one source that I heard, uh, at least uh, every uh, uh, how to say. It? One people from five uh, from our younger generations want to leave our country. <laughs> That's uh, sad news, but it's how the thing is. Um, also, as far as I know, there is some good uh, people 
still in our economics sector uh, they try to improve but it uh, there are a lot of other people and it's and um, actually we have some chance uh, with uh, changing economic economic co- course and just we need we will see how uh, goes in uh, next few years and also another uh, another some kind of uh, how to say um, people movement it's uh, more actually more for people get, got started more proactive and try to read uh, and listen more about politics systems economics and how it can be changed all of stuff yeah so. yeah but there is a thing about this uh, what uh, he was uh, one of quarter of uh, Yeroilo it's uh, about um uh one of things is about listening to all the communications of uh, Russian citizens uh save all data by transfer to each other on the internet and save me- metadata uh on SMS communications etc uh but anyway uh, what's interesting about this is uh, what he now works in Acronis maybe <laughs> it's yes a crisis he uh, works on on security there actually not sure exactly what the description of work but it's an acronym now it's pretty interesting uh, it seems like uh, everyone the everybody else uh, say it uh, like where all oligarchs around there and uh, steal so much etc but actually uh, I think uh, working a chronic is a uh, better opportunity for him now when he is not uh, fond of our politics. Uh, so. yes. um, digital security in one, is one of the hottest topics now, so <laughs> he will uh, definitely have uh, interesting stuff to do. Yeah. And one more thing uh, about this uh, story, this engine, I think we uh, should not uh, describe it uh, very uh, detailedly because um, mainly it's all who knows about this uh, have info. Uh, yes, it's all over the places. Yeah, but uh, I want to tell what uh, uh, we are uh, supporting. Igor, uh, and we are believe he is uh, innocent here, and uh, we will provide support if, if needed. Uh, do you agree with me or not? Yes, of course, we support, we support the, he, his, um, uh, we can provide uh, our help if needed. Uh, I wish uh, everything will be settled uh, according to law, without problems and our help uh, even not be needed so but uh, recently there are some um, some different uh, occurrences uh, not lawful things happening and uh, I think anyway uh, the truth will prevail so. yes Yeah, and uh, I think uh, we can uh, finish on some positive on some positive note. Uh, what do you think <laughs> we can finish on? For example, about uh, <laughs> search for uh, he IV WhatsApp, maybe soon be over. And also Bill Gates uh, saying now uh, about importance of mass statistics and cause effect. Something about that. What do you think? Um, can you repeat, please? Just I have some disturbance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, there is one new uh, news about uh, importance of mass statistics and cause effect, uh, what said by Bill Gates. Another one, uh, what uh, search for uh, HIV vaccine uh, maybe soon not be over. 
like uh, your disease. Uh, very good. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, let's talk about Bill Gates. Uh, what's going on? Yeah, uh, he described his childhood uh, in this video, and uh, he's uh, uh, told uh, very, very good things about what math field as a professional field is not so, uh, uh, let's say, uh, it's not so. It will be use, useful for you uh, if you only do a math. But math by itself is very useful in uh, uh, all practical aspects. And math, statistics and cause effect, if you know more about them, it uh, can influence you in very good aspects. It can help you achieve uh, many things what could be not so easily achieved otherwise. So it's very important to have such basic uh, scientific uh, training, please. Yes, yes, it's it's very uh, uh, good. Uh, nice, it's nice to have if you uh, very uh, trained in math, <laughs> at least uh, for general algorithm. It's, it's very good, uh, especially in, in uh, IT sphere. Yeah. I still uh, really fascinated about uh, the uh, new storage technology, uh, how they uh, could store data inside glass. Just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But anyway, uh, uh, Bill Gates uh, and Microsoft are now not not so related to each other. <laughs> But yes, yeah, that's uh, very interesting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, all for now. Uh, for the next episode, uh, we will be uh, recording in uh, around uh, two weeks, as usual, by Shadow. But uh, yes. see you later. Bye. Bye. See you later.